and join the group that shows up every morning for coffee. Because one of the rules when you go to McDonald's for coffee in the morning and visit with the other people, you have to have married kids. And it's okay. He, he gets to make that transition. Matter of fact, he bought me one of those coffee cups this year where you get free coffee. I can even loan him that so we don't have to spend any money. But uh, y'all, if you get a chance to come Saturday, please be here. I know that uh, Lily and Jonathan would appreciate it. But keep the family in prayer. It's a big thing. Uh, it's a big transition for the whole group. How many know it's, it's a big step? Those of you that had kids that have gotten married know exactly what Berhe is talking about. And so please uh, keep them in prayer. We're going to go ahead and uh, go on in our Bible study. We're still talking about healing. And let Berhe just tell you ahead of time, uh, we need to talk about this. We need to be talking about healing. We need to understand it a little bit better sometimes. And, and I hope that you're getting out of some of the things that Berhe has talked to you and shared with you from God's Word. And we talked about it last week for those that weren't here. If you're going to have faith, always remember that faith comes through God's Word. That's the secret. You have to get into his word. And the more you get into his word, the more you understand it, the more you bury it into your heart and make it part of your everyday life. How many know you can't just read it? How many know you have to live it? And I always think about this. When I know LeGore Hay played sports. Uh, how many know there are some people that are just gifted athletes? And, and at the high school level especially, the gifted athlete doesn't have to work as hard as everybody else. Unless maybe they're in a super big school. But if it's a team sport and they're a gifted athlete, I will tell you ahead of time, they can kind of slack off on the training, they can kind of slack off on the things, and their individual skill and ability will keep them head and shoulders above other people. When they leave high school and they go to college, how many know that it changes? All of a sudden, when they show up on that college campus, do you know what? All those other guys are equal now in that skill and ability. And so when we start talking about Christianity, don't think just because you're not a preacher and you haven't been to Bible college or you haven't been to seminary or you haven't read all these books and you haven't done all these things, I promise you that you have something that God has given each individual. And that's a measure of faith. And when he gives you that measure of faith, he also promised that if we're open before him, that he'll open our understanding to his word. And what levels the playing field is when people realize that it's not always about you. Some of them guys, when they get to college, they still think it's about them, don't they? I mean, you know, they can have enough talent. They might be able to do that. Uh, some of you might not know him, but Johnny Menzel is a guy that always comes to Burhay's mind. Very talented athlete. Exceptional athlete. When he got to college, how I many know he was still head and shoulders above other people? But when he stepped on the stage with those professionals, can I tell you everything kind of caught up to him? And the other day I was watching a program and he's thinking about making a comeback, but one of the things he had to realize is not just about him. And so when Bernhay thinks about Christianity, you don't have to put all this pressure on yourself. Sometimes we do that. But we have to remember that God is on our side. And we need to separate out some of these other things that are there. And if you'll do that, I promise you'll never, ever be disappointed because God will come to your rescue. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, the question you have there it, it is, what did uh, Christ give us power over? And let's just read what it says. And when he called unto him his 12 disciples... He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. This didn't happen when Jesus was getting ready to transcend into heaven. This was when he was on earth and his ministry was going on and he sent the 12 out to minister. Now, something I need to tell you. If Jesus told them that they would have power over evil spirits, how many think that sometimes we're going to encounter some unclean spirits out there? And you think about that. There's a lot of people who tell you, no, bro, hey, that kind of stuff, you know, that's not real. It is real. And there's a real enemy out there that we battle against. The other thing that he put here is he promised them 
that they would be able to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, again, sometimes that healing process has to do with us getting to a place where we no longer let that sickness and disease define who we are. There are, each one of us will leave this world unless the rapture takes place of something. And somebody said to me here a while back, they said, oh, Brother Hay, I disagree with you. People don't always die of something. Sometimes they just die of old age. And I started laughing. And I said, well, I just want you to know now that I'm older, how many know getting old is not for the faint of heart? <laughs> right? Would you agree with me, Brother George? It's not for the faint of heart. You need to understand that as you get older, there's some things you're going to go through, right? But here's what sticks out in Brother Hay's mind about that. At some point, how many know that each one of us has an appointment? And what I want you to understand is, if how many of you know people that are 90 years old, but you wouldn't even know they were 90 years old unless somebody told you? Some of them are still driving their cars. I like this. Some of them get up and go to work. Some of them have things to do, have places to go, right? Somebody forgot to tell them they were 90 years old. Do you know what really happened? They did not let their age define who they were. In other words, they have faith in something bigger than themselves. And so I promise you that those that, it, this has always been one of them kind of dilemmas for Brother Hay. Uh, when I was in going through college and working on my master's degree and some of those things, some of the classes I'd have to take, I'd read books written by people in their 30s about people that were in their 80s. I used to think, really? How many know when you're in your 30s, you really don't understand what it means to be 80? How many know when you're 80, you have a different understanding of 80? Because you're living through it, right? And what is so interesting, you have this person that's 30-some years old telling everybody that's 80 what they need to do, George. And then here's what always clicks in Barry's mind. How many will agree with me that all our life we have somebody telling us what we need to do? Would you agree with me? All the teenagers just got mad, Brother Hay. Because I know what they're thinking. As soon as I turn 18, nobody's going to be my boss. <laughs> Leo, how's that work for you if you go into work and you tell them, hey, you're not my boss? See, he already knows. <laughs> Uh, it, it's kind of funny, right, Ben? You go into work, it don't even matter how long you work there, does it? You walk into your boss and go, you know what? I decided today I'm my own man, and you're no longer my boss. I'm not so sure that's going to work out so well. Right? <laughs> so what we forget here is that it doesn't matter who you are. There's always going to be that challenge in your life where there's somebody that's going to tell you what to do. Now, you might be a billionaire, and you might say, hey, Man, if I was a billionaire, nobody would tell me what to do. I'd do whatever I wanted to. And I tell you, a lot of people that are billionaires have a whole lot of people telling them what to do. And a whole lot of people trying to get what they have. Does that make sense? Or take what they have. And so you need to kind of get this in mind, that it's not about somebody telling you what to do, but here's something that you need to figure out. Not everything you hear do you need to let go in. When I look at this scripture, Jesus could have told them so many different things. We're talking about healing. He not could only warn about unclean spirits, right, Sister Phyllis, and tell them that they could heal all manner of diseases and all sickness and these kind of things. He said he was going to give them power over those things. Man, Jesus could have warned them about all kinds of stuff. He could have said, you're going to run into some people that like to gossip. Matter of fact, you're going to run into some people when you show up in that town to pray for people that are sick and miracles are going to happen, and you're going to get in trouble because somebody got healed. Because you didn't exactly do it the way that they thought you ought to do it. He could have told them a lot of things. But Jesus was very general in what he gave them, because you know what he figured out, or what Jesus wanted them to do? Not to be afraid to make some decisions on their own part. And here's what I mean by that. When I'm talking about healing, and we're talking about these things as we go through these, Try to keep in mind that God doesn't want us to be little robots and going through certain things. God wants us 
to have a relationship with him. And because of that relationship, what he's trying to get across to us is it's okay for us to be uniquely who we are. You don't have to be anybody else. Okay? You know, I read a thing the other day, and it said Kevin Copeland is the one evangelist that's worth more than anybody else. Anybody got to guess how much money they said he was worth? Who wants to guess? <laughs> he's got a couple of jet planes. Yeah, he's got a couple of airplanes. I give you a hint. He's worth $760 million. Can Barhey promise you that the majority of people that are evangelists, how many know, Brother Michael, the ones that show up at our place aren't making $760 million? They'll probably never see a million dollars in their lifetime. They have a call in their life. They're doing what God's called them to do. They're being faithful, Sister Phyllis. But what if all of a sudden I pick up one of Kenneth Copeland's books and I read what he says and I think that he's the authority just based on how much money he has? It's the same as Fred Price. Same as Fred Price? He had a couple of airplanes too. Oh, yeah, he had a lot of money too. But he didn't even make the top ten, just in case you're wondering, Sister Lane. Well, he started and Kenneth was following him. Yeah, he so he, he didn't even make the top ten. And I was like, whoa, because yeah. I thought about him. Yeah, he was pretty good. And I thought about several others. I mean, but here's what Brahe is getting at. You can be a healing evangelist. Can I tell you that the answer is still in God's word? Jesus said that the disciples were going to be given this power and you'll see when we get a little bit further along, it don't cost you. As a matter of fact, if they charge for it, you're in a lot of trouble. Do you think that maybe Fred stuck with the colors more so than than uh, Kenneth? Kenneth went to everybody, whereas I think Fred stayed with the... Uh, kind of within his group. Yeah. I'm not too sure, Sister Lane, but here's what I know for sure. There's a lot of good people inside that faith movement, and yeah. here's what Brother Hay disagrees with. <laughs> And I said this last week, and I'll keep saying it, and hopefully it'll catch on. Be careful that you don't start worshiping faith as being higher than who Jesus is. Yes. Because at the end of the day, we got to remember who we believe in. I, I don't think his son, is his son still preaching? Yeah, as far as I know. I'm not sure. But I think it's the longest running program, so I think his son must have took it over I, now. I'm not too crazy so. about him so much. <laughs> But here's the thing, all these things, right, that Jesus promised. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, because number 36 says, mention four things which Christ commanded his disciples to do. This, this just gets good to Brother Hay. He said, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. But here's the key to this. Freely ye have what? Received. And how are you supposed to give this stuff out? Okay, so none of you are going to come to Brother Hay three months from now and say, Brother Hay, I got this letter in the mail, and I've really been sick, and I've been praying about this. And in this letter, it says, if I'll send them a love gift, trust me, they're not 20 bucks a month anymore. But if I send them a love gift for X number of dollars, they promise God is going to heal me. Do you think that contradicts this? No, I'll just call you. You're going to call Brother Hay? Okay. But, but here's what I want to tell you. Brother Hay is not making fun of them. I'm not making light of them. I'm not saying they're bad people. But here's what you got to hear. The church had better get back to understanding that we need to base what we believe on God's word and not what people tell us. It's not about formulas. It's not about coming up with one size fits all. It doesn't work that way. Okay. Some of you are in different places. Brother Hay is a different age group. There's some that's a little bit older than me, my mom's group, and Sister Elaine, some of them are a little bit older than Brother Hay. You know, they're a little bit different than Brother Hay. Some of you are in Michael's group that's not very far behind, even though they think they are. But anyway, they're, they're closer than they think. We have our teenagers that are going, Brother Hay, this stuff is so far out of my mind, I can't even get my arms around it right now. But I promise you they'll wake up before they know it, and it's going to be on top of it. I saw Jonathan today in Walmart, and I was laughing. This is why I told him. I said, Jonathan, I love you. And I said, you know, you got one more counseling session before you can get married. 
I know, Papa. We only got one more day to get this done, okay? <laughs> but he knows, right? And then I said to him, oh, and by the way, tomorrow is the fifth, and rent is due. Poor Jonathan, he's just standing there looking at his papa like, really, papa? You know, I'm getting married Saturday. He didn't say a word, but how many know that's exactly what he was saying with his eyes? It's funny to for, hey. I put my arm around him. I said, you know, papa loves you. He said, yep. I said, how does it feel to enter into being a full-fledged adult in charge of all your own stuff? He, he didn't answer me. <laughs> so all you teenagers that are in a big hurry to jump out there and get involved in this, you need to realize it's a whole lot better when somebody else is worrying about paying the rent. It's a whole lot better when somebody else has to figure out how to put food on your table. It's a whole lot easier for somebody else to figure out how you're going to get the money to do whatever those things are that you want to do to pay for your cell phone and all or whatever it is that's going on in your life as a teenager. But here's the flip side of this. I believe this with all my heart. That you got to be careful that you don't discourage people because how many know that we want to raise children that can take care of who they are in that next step, right? How many of you want your kids living with you when they're 65 years old and you're still paying all the bills? Now, I'm not trying to be mean here. Michael's just smiling. He hasn't got this group yet, but he's going to be there. So but Saturday's going to be fun for Brother Hayden. I just got to do the wedding, and it's, it's good for me, right? But here's the thing. I, I'm not trying to be mean. But how many know that we want our children to grow up and be independent? You need to encourage your children to stand on their own two feet. You need to encourage your children not to be afraid to take chances. But here's what I want to tell you. Do you know how many Christians, Brother Hay knows, that have been serving God for 25 years, and they still can't pray and ask God to heal them? It drives me crazy. And here's why Brother Hay says that. Do you know why they're afraid to do that, Ben? Because nobody told them they could. In their mind, only certain people have this power. And I want you to know that when Jesus came, he gave this power to the disciples, but here's the difference. We're going to get to Scripture in a minute. It's going to say, after he went away, do you know that every one of you have that power within you? You just need to release it. And I get in trouble for this because a lot of preachers don't like you to preach this. I believe in the power of the saints, not only as a collective group, but I believe in it individually. And what I mean by that is I believe if Sister Phyllis shows up in one of her volunteer places and somebody says, pray for me, I believe you can pray for him, Sister Phyllis, and God can heal him. And you don't even have to call Brother Hay or Brother Michael or anybody else. You can pray for him right on the spot, and the power of God can flow through you and touch them. You know what happened to the Pentecostal church? We like this corporate thing. If people need prayer, call the preacher. You know how it used to be in the Pentecostal church? They called each other. You know why they called each other? And I'll be honest with you, because a lot of times the preacher was working a 40-hour-a-week job plus just to survive, just like them. And you know what, Brother Secretary? They couldn't always get a hold of them. But you know, somewhere there was a grandma that was retired, that believed in prayer, that prayed for people, and wasn't afraid or embarrassed of her relationship with God. And you know what? Sometimes they would call that grandma, and you know what would happen? That grandma would show up at their house and pray for them. And God would touch them. People say, now come on, brother. Hey, you know, you're trying to set us back 60 years. We don't want to operate like that. We're not operating the way God told us. If you depend on one person, you're in a whole lot of trouble. You know what I figured out? You want to know why the military works in the United States compared to all these other countries? It's real easy. In our military, correct me if I'm wrong, George, Brother Secretary, Randy, some of these guys are here. They've been like that with Brother Hay. You're the new group, okay? Leo, you get to be the youngest. I, I won't pick on you. But here's the deal from our, our Brother Hay's experience. You know what? If my supervisor was taken out, 
Somebody else took his place. If that person was taken out, you know what happened, Bo Santeri? Somebody else took his place. On the job training, that's what they used to call it. They'd say, hey, you're now the guy in charge. I remember one time I was in an exercise. We've been doing this thing for like eight or nine days. We were having an inspection. They were pretty intense kind of things. And we're going through this week long. They used to call more our eyes. I don't know what they call them now, but that's what they called ours. And an operational readiness inspection. And this thing lasted for a whole week. And you know what they used to do? They would come in there and wipe out all the leadership. And all them crazy master sergeants and all them chiefs, you know what happened? They got to go drink coffee somewhere, and they wanted to see what we would do. And all of a sudden, you look around and you go, I don't got a boss. Hey, we need to put this airplane in the air. Somebody's got to sign this paperwork off. Well, guess what? You've just been elected. You're now the guy in charge. Here's this paperwork you get to make this decision. Can I tell you, that's what sets our military apart from all these other places. Because if the other ones, what happens, Brother Secretary, you get the boss out, what do they do? Oh. <laughs> Man, they're gone. <laughs> you know why they're gone? Brother Hay figured this out. Early on in my military career, I went to Egypt one time, and I'll never, ever forget this. There used to be some guys there that were guarding the runway and those kind of things. They were in the Egyptian army. I used to always wonder how miraculous God for God for the Israelites to beat that army in that six-day war. You know that? Until I got there. I said, I wonder what took them so long. And you say, bro, hey, that's not nice. Let me tell you what I figured out. They had no loyalty, no connection to each other. They were there because if they didn't show up, somebody would go get them and shoot them. They don't play. But the first chance that the boss is gone, guess what happens? Hey, man. What do you think? There's nobody watching this now, man. We got our moment. We're out of here. And they were gone. And I want you to think about this. In the Iraq War, we actually literally, believe it or not, had a scout group. Now think about this. 10, 15 guys. A forward scouting group that took 2,500 men prisoner. They surrendered <laughs> to 10, 15 guys. Can I tell you, in our military, that would never happen. It would not have happened. But they had no loyalty. They had no purpose. Can I tell you what the enemy's done to the church? He's done that same thing. We don't have a loyalty to Christ. We don't have loyalty to each other. We're not bonded together like we need to be. So guess what? When things happen, people scatter. How many know when things happen, that's when we need to pull together? Okay? It doesn't matter. If somebody in the body is sick, how many know all of us need to be concerned? And we need to pray for each other. Because how many know that at some point you will have your turn where you're the one that's going to need the prayer? You're the one that's going to need that support. Does that make sense? So what I learned early on in the military was, you know, all those guys I didn't like, <laughs> I learned I better learn how to get along with them. Because at some point, I might be in charge. And if I don't like them and they don't like me, can I just tell you, it does not work out well. There's nothing worse than somebody trying to be in charge of a group. Now think about this. And the whole group goes, I'm not listening. Okay, for all you parents, teenagers, close your ears for one second. Let me relate this in a way that all the parents understand. How many times in your family when you're dealing with your teenagers, that's how you feel? <laughs> they're not listening. You're talking, but they're not listening. You're not together as a family. And for now, the teenagers need to open your ears. Because all those times when you think your parents are against you, they're not against you. They're looking out for you. But if you don't recognize that they're looking out for you, do you see how all of a sudden this becomes a real chaotic situation? So when we're talking about this, we need to see this. Look, Jesus said, hey, when you go out there, you need to heal the sick. You need to cleanse the lepers. Leprosy always denotes sin. But that means people need to be born again. Raise the dead. How many know when you are out there and you're lost and you don't have a relationship with Christ, you are really a walking dead person? People always get mad when I say that, but it's true. We have no hope. You have nothing. Michael and I talked about this. When we do funerals for people that we know, 
don't believe in eternity or don't believe in God and don't believe in a relationship with Christ, can I tell you when they lose a loved one, you want to talk about a lack of hope for their signature? It's gone. And if that person happens to be 50 years old and all of a sudden this person that passed away was 53 years old, how many know they got a different perspective all of a sudden of what this world's all about? And so what Barhe is trying to get across here is we need to understand that this stuff's real. And when they're talking about casting out devils, how many know that's not just only talking about the actual casting out of evil spirits, but how many know that what it's really talking about is your life being purged from those things that you shouldn't be involved in? Now, i got to clarify something. I do not believe that Christians can be demon-possessed. Will you please... At least, if you don't hear nothing else Brother Hay says tonight, I don't care if you're a teenager or adult, I don't care, you need to hear this one. Christians cannot be demon-possessed. Period. End of story. Anything that crosses the bloodline of Christ is going to be born again. So if that evil spirit gets in you, they got to get saved first. But anyway. I was told that, but I was also told they can be demon-oppressed. That's right. And you know how we get demon-oppressed? It's really real simple. The Bible says be careful who you put yourself or allow to control you. In other words, if you allow the enemy to be in control of you, how many know he can oppress you? How many of you have ever, ever, ever just been discouraged? I mean literally discouraged. Do you know that can be oppression? And people will say to me, now, brother, hey, be real cautious with this. I am being cautious. Do you know according to God's word, we're not supposed to be that way. This one uh, scripture I'm really fond of teaching talking about the spirit of heart. Mm-hmm. You know, when people think of oppression, in fact, I brought this up to Josh and his wife. I said, when you, you ask someone, what oppresses you? I said, you'd be amazed. People always point to this thing, that thing, that thing. Never point back to themselves. Perhaps out of anger, but that spirit of hurt, it is, I mean, it is capacity. And is it real? It's real. How many of you have been hurt and you knew you were hurt? And, of course, you get the good Christians come along and say, well, you know, you need to just toughen up and be a little stronger. <laughs> okay, let me tell you adults for our teenagers. We need to be careful not to discourage them to a point where they lose hope. But by the same token, we have to understand that no matter where we're like at in this lifeline that we have been given, we need to understand that a lot of times that hurt, we got to recognize that it's real. I have trouble when people say, okay, bro, hey, you know what? Uh, I, I really have this illness, but I'm not claiming this illness. I'm not even going to mention that illness because I'm not going to allow that word even to get in my head. And I go, okay, you just don't claim whatever you don't want to. That doesn't change the fact whether or not you have it, right? Now, I understand where they're going with this. Because in a lot of cases, how many know that we open ourselves up to things by what we're willing to accept? Now, here's what I tell people all the time. If you think somebody doesn't like you, how many know that everything they say becomes suspect? They can walk in and go, good morning. Right? Okay, Kimmy, you guys are the youngest one, so you gotta get picked on here. Okay, you're a teenager, but if, if there's somebody that you don't like and they walk in and they say good morning, you might think to yourself, ha, what do they tell me good morning for? What do they want? That ever happened to you? See, she don't want to answer and it's okay. <laughs> but let Barhe just tell you straight up, I can answer for her because I can answer for you. We've all been there. And for people to deny those kind of things is why we don't get over this stuff. Because do you know before God can deal, am I telling the truth about the same term? Before God can deal with the hurt, you've got to recognize that the hurt is real. And you've also got to recognize that God wants to come and minister to it. But the way God ministers to the hurt is what you need to understand. He ministers to the hurt by ministering to you. Now think about that. Okay, all of us, I hope you have this kind of experience some point in your life. For the younger ones, they might not have been there yet, but I hope they have. 
I hope that some adult has done the right thing in their life for them at some point. But most people that live for any amount of time can remember a time when they were really in a bad place and somebody came and put an arm around them or said the right word when they needed to do it. Now here's Barry's point. Even at that moment, you had to receive that. Does that make sense? If you don't receive that from the person that's giving it to you, no matter how much they offer it, does it really do a lot of good? Do you see kind of where Brother Hay is going with this? That's why when I see these things, we got to understand that God said, look, this isn't about charging people. This isn't about how much money you can give. This isn't about how many degrees you have besides your name. It's not whether you can you know, throw a football better than anybody else or kick one further or whatever the case might be, jump higher, run faster, look nicer. You fill in the blanks, Brother doesn't really care. <laughs> all right, I'm trying to cover all my bases so I don't get in trouble. But here's the thing. All those things being said, what God is trying to tell you is, look, in spite of all that stuff, God is standing there holding his hands out to minister to you, reaching out towards you, but you have to make an effort to take that hand. Years ago, I used to do this. I haven't done it for a long time. And, and you got to be careful, because the last time I did this, the person took my money and didn't give it back. <laughs> but a long time ago, I took a $20 bill, and I went to somebody, and I said, here, I'm going to give you this $20. Of course, they're looking at Brother Hay, and they're like, huh, why? I said, just because I want to give it to you. I give it to somebody I thought would give it back to me. <laughs> so I had to learn the other side of this lesson, right? But what I was trying to point out to him was, lots of times God is coming trying to hand you something. He's trying to give you encouragement when you're discouraged. He's offering you healing when you need a healing. He's offering you peace when you need peace. Listen, our young people need peace in their life more than ever before. Amen. This is the craziest time I've ever seen. There's so much junk out there. How many know they need to know something's real? That's right. But all those things that God offers you can only work if you accept them. Now, that person took my 20 bucks. <coughs> now, I give it to them. I said there was no strings attached. But in my mind, I'm thinking, now, after church, they're going to be really generous and be a good Christian and give me back my 20 bucks. They never did. Now, here's the flip side. I don't do that anymore. <laughs> Michael. And they were coming to church looking for a blessing. That's right, and they got one. They were praying for a blessing. God bless them. And I'm thinking, yeah, but you know, I really need that 20 bucks. <laughs> but anyway, here's the other side of that. It actually works better that they kept my $20. Do you know why? Because most of the time when we give that, we're not really freely giving it. In the back of our mind, we got some strings attached. In the back of our mind, we're wanting it back. <laughs> in the back of our mind, we're, we're wanting something in return. Okay? I'm going to love you, but in return for me loving you, here's my list. You know, put your clothes in the laundry, uh, do your own dishes, you know, whatever. <laughs> put the seat up or put the seat down, whatever the case might be in your house. Whatever the case is, right? Here's my list if you're going to love me. But what Brother Hay wants to get across to you, what Jesus is trying to get across to you, is this is not about a cost to us. He's already given it to us freely. That's why we just celebrated Easter. It's why he went to the cross for you and I. Now think about that. He paid the total price once and for all. And we don't have to. Now, please don't get mad at me, but I'm going to tell you this anyway. I know a lot of Christians that crucify themselves on a regular basis. when that's already been taken care of by Christ. And here's what I mean by that. Well, I know that Jesus has forgiven me, but he really didn't mean that he would forgive me of this. I know that Jesus said that he loved me, but I'm not sure he can love me at this very moment because, you see where Barhe is going? And so when we start talking about this healing and all these things, as individual people, it is difficult for us to believe 
that anybody would do anything for us without expecting something in return. And that's what's frightening. Because one of the reasons we have trouble believing that is there's not enough Christians living that way anymore. Think about how many, one of my favorite Little House on the Prairie stories, okay? I really didn't like that show much, but anyway, I was forced to watch it because Sister Hay liked it, just so y'all know. But anyway, if I wasn't working Ben and that was on, guess what I was watching? But y'all remember the Christmas, and, and they have a cartoon, a Mickey Mouse cartoon. I didn't even know that until I watched that with Brandon, and they always show it at Christmas time. In the Mickey Mouse cartoon, Minnie has this gift that she wants to give Mickey, but it doesn't work because the thing that she's buying the gift for, Mickey gives away in order to buy her a gift. The Little House on the Prairie is kind of the same thing. They're trying to give each other something, right? But imagine what the church and the world would be like if people really lived like that and had that kind of relationship with each other. I know what you're all thinking. Yep, brother, hey, you're going to be taking advantage of them and they're going to be ripping you off. But here's the way I always look at it. <laughs> I had this discussion, it's been a few years ago, with somebody, and they told me, they said, well, you're just too easy, you're a chump. I said, okay, I'll take that. I said, but I just want you to know, here's what I believe. When I'm a chump for Christ, he's got a record. That person that thinks they're making me a chump, you know what, my secretary? <laughs> God's got a record. And right now, I might look like a chump. It might look bad. It might look like I was being a pushover. It might look like, hey, you know, I didn't do what I needed to. But you know what happens? One of these days, the Bible says the books get open. And you know what? Somebody's going to hear do you remember that day? And I won't be the chump anymore. I'd be doing what I was supposed to have done. Does that make sense? And so it, it's kind of like when you're 18 years old and you're trying to figure out this world. How many were 18 and knew everything? I think I started knowing everything when I was about 12. But anyway, I, I, I was an early mature. <laughs> but anyhow, I, I just want you to understand the brain. Now I'm, I'm north of 60 years old, and I can tell you for a surety, there's so much stuff that I never understood and I still struggle with. Does that make sense? Because one of the things that I figured out as I got older, Ben, was there's a whole lot more to learn than I ever thought was possible. Because to be honest with you, I didn't really think there was anything out there to be learned. And until you change your attitude, how many know you're not learning anything? And, and it's a life lesson for you tonight. I don't care how old you are. If you ever get to a place where you think you got this thing figured out, you need to recheck yourself and start over, find an altar someplace, and say, God, open my eyes and cause me to be able to see what I need to see. Because I promise you that God's got a lot more for you to do. Just, just the way that it is. Okay. So let's go now <laughs> to M Matthew 17:20. Because when the disciples fell to heal an epileptic, two reasons Jesus gave for that not happening. And I think everybody in Christianity right now probably agrees with the, this answer, and we hear it all the time. It should be Matthew 17, 20, Brother Randy, and 21. Here's what it says. Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you had the faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you should say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, it shall remove. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by, ah, man, things we hate to think about, prayer and fasting. I want you to know that the failure came because of their unbelief. And also, Jesus said, some things only happen through prayer and fasting. And what has to happen here is we got to have a meeting of the minds on this healing thing. Sometimes this unbelief thing is more real than we really want to admit. Want to know why Jesus used the grain of a mustard seed as an example? I got to ask you a simple question. And, and I ask this of a lot of people when they're struggling spiritually, and I want you to think about it. How many think 
Which one's bigger, a measure or a mustard seed? Have you ever thought about it? The Bible says every man, woman, and child has been given a measure of faith. Would you agree, Brother Hay? Yeah. How many of you have ever seen a mustard seed? I used to have one in my Bible, but you know that thing was so small I lost it. It was actually in one of those little self faith things. Somebody had given it to me. I said, oh, this is cool, man. I can hold this up. See, this is what a great mustard seed looks like. It disappeared out of my Bible. It probably got torn, and who knows where it ended up. But here's what Brother Hay wants to get across to you. When people start saying you don't have enough faith, you need to say to them, what do you mean I don't have enough faith? God, give me a measure of faith. This might not be a faith issue. You might have more than enough faith for the circumstance. What if, <laughs> you're not going to like this one, what if it's a prayer or a fasting thing? Can I tell you what happens when you really get down to pray? Sometimes God says, hey man, I hate to break this to you, but you're not praying according to my will. <laughs> when I was young and I used to say, hey man, people get mad at me nowadays. People are like, really? That's not no big deal. I know, because things have really changed a lot, right? But the reason Brother Hayes said it that way is because I believe God talks to us in, in the language we can understand. You know what I'm waiting for? I'm waiting for somebody to come to church and for them to say they weren't watching Gunsmoke, but they were playing something on their iPad and the Holy Spirit spoke to them. They don't have Gunsmoke no more. I hate to break it to you. <laughs> They're not watching Gunsmoke on their iPads. But anyway. But you know what Brother Hay believes? I believe God can speak to us through whatever means is necessary to get your attention. But I get so angry when I hear people say to Christians, you don't have enough faith. If you just had a little more faith, then God would do this for you. You know what you need to answer? You know what? That needs to go back to the same pit it came out of. Because God already gave me plenty of faith for this circumstance. Because he gave me a whole measure of faith. And if a little grain, a little seed of faith is enough to move a mountain, how many know we should have plenty of faith for whatever comes along our way? I think when it comes to healing, a lot of times people, people are doubting and they really don't realize they're doubting because they believe God can, but they're not so sure if he will. That's right. I think God can, but I'm not sure he will. And then all of a sudden, we get into trouble, right? Now, is that because of a lack of faith in God? Or could it be we haven't studied enough of God's word to realize that God has a desire to meet every single need that you have? We have blinders on, and we want it now, and we want to see it. That's right. We want now. We want to see it. We're in the microwave thing. You know, it's funny. Uh, I remember being an old guy, how hard it used to be to make popcorn. Y'all remember that? You had to get a skillet, you had to have oil, you had to pour it in there. Man, if you had a lot of kids, George, that was a hassle, right? I mean, it was work to make popcorn. Y'all laughing, but you just don't understand. I remember when they came out with this thing called Jiffy Pop. Anybody remember that? I always burned it. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that's just what I was going to say, Sister Lane. They come out with this Jiffy Pop. It's supposed to be the answer. You put it on a stove, and nine times out of ten, it came out just like Brother Hay liked it. Burnt. Nobody else wanted to eat it, but I'd be like, hey, it works for me. I like burnt popcorn. So I was okay for Brother Hay. But it, it, it wasn't the answer, right? How many of you remember the little electric popcorn poppers they had? You pour some oil in there, and it goes to the little circle. You pour your popcorn, you measure it out, you put it in there, and it pop that whole thing full of popcorn. Y'all remember those? All the kids are, come on, brother. Hey, really? We really did these things. Yeah. Just so you know. <laughs> Here's another great invention. They came out with an air popper. Anybody remember those? Oh, yeah. yeah, and those air poppers were so cool, you could even put butter on top of it. It's supposed to, they, that never ever worked in my house. <laughs> But anyway, it would pop the popcorn at least. Man, that stuff tasted terrible. But anyway, I just didn't like popcorn. Man, now we get the bag, we put it in the microwave, hit the button, 
Man, we don't even have to put the time in anymore. When was the last time you saw a microwave that didn't have a popcorn button? <laughs> You're probably right, Tiny. They probably all have. All the kids in here are going, what are you talking about, brother? Hey, uh, I thought that's just the way life was. That's not how this worked. We used to have microwaves without popcorn buttons. <laughs> Michael. Uh, mine and Donna's microwave was a wedding present 25 years ago, and it has a popcorn button. Yeah, see? They've been around forever. <laughs> and so we, we live in that, right? We popped popcorn the other night, and it said, do not use the popcorn button. <laughs> <laughs> Now we gotta have a warning because you know, <laughs> I'm sure somebody pushed a popcorn button and it mal malfunctioned and caught a fire or something. Some lawyer got involved and sued somebody for millions of dollars. Wasn't for hey. But I just want you to think about it. Isn't that kind of the world we're living in? But here's what why prayer is so cool. Please listen to this prayer thing. When you go to prayer and there's something going on in your life. Have you ever prayed until you felt the peace of God over the circumstance? Now think about this for a minute. There have been times in my life that God has given me a peace about a circumstance, and you're all going to laugh when I tell you this, I stop praying about it. And people always say, brother, hey, you're not supposed to stop praying. I got my answer. God gave me peace about it. God gave me a reassurance it was in his hands. How many of you know, the second you get peace about it, everything that can go wrong about that circumstance goes wrong. Right? I remember with Brother Jimmy when I was praying for him, and I know he's not here, but I, I will tell you, when he first got his diagnosis, and Sister A and I went with them to the cancer doctor, and they reassured him that they're probably going to be able to do this and this, you know the first thing that came up? They called him up and said, hey, uh, we got to do this other test. And they did the other test, and they were 90% sure. Matter of fact, this is exactly what the doctor said. I've never seen this on any scan when it was not lung cancer. Can I just be honest with you? I have a God that's better than a scan. And you know what I told Brother Jimmy? I said, Brother Jimmy, I said, did God give you peace? He said, Yes. I said, even if it's lung cancer, it's going to be okay. God gave you peace about it. Why do you want to pick it back up? Now, I want you to think about this with Brother Hay. How many of you have prayed for your kids, give them to God, got peace about it? Don't put your hand up, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then those crazy kids go and do something else. And you're like, God, really? I, I, Okay. We don't pray like we need to until we get the assurance from God that no matter what the answer is, whether it's what we want or don't want, that he's got it. That's what this means, that you've got to pray <coughs> until you hear from heaven. I know people don't want you to talk about it. I, I, we're getting close to time to leave here tonight. Verhey understands how hard it is to be in a Bible study for an hour. I understand you guys got a lot of things going on. I don't ever want to waste your time. But here's what you need to know. You can't hurry prayer. Sometimes, you know what you have to do, Sister Phyllis? You got to get up when nobody else is around and pray. And you got to stay there until you are convinced that you've heard from heaven. Now, how many of you have been like Brother Hay and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, prayed some more, and still never got an assurance? Maybe I'm just a bad Christian. Maybe I don't have enough faith. I don't know. But I've had those times in my life. Can I tell you, that's when I count on Brother Singletary, not a grain of faith, not a seed of faith. <laughs> I'm not even going to go there because I was tempted to go down that rabbit hole. I'm just telling you, be careful what you let people tell you. But here's what I have to do. I reach into that measure of faith, Sister Elaine. And all of a sudden, you know what I begin to believe? God, you're bigger than my unbelief. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is when that man, 
when Jesus said to him, do you believe? And what did he say to Jesus? Man, he answered for me, Ben. He answered for Brother Hay. You know what he said? Lord, help my unbelief. In other words, help me to reach into the measure of faith that you have given me and help me to trust you. Now, the fasting thing, we don't even talk about fasting. I know in the Catholic Church, they just went through Lent. It's amazing to Brother Hay, but people give up for Lent. <laughs> And, and I understand the whole purpose. And, and you know, there's a reason why they have Mardi Gras. Anybody know why? <clears throat> I do. Why, sister? You want me to tell you? Yes. Because it was uh, Malachi's wife mm -hmm. was went to the king and said, please spare my people. And she found out that... Uh, He's going to uh, kill. Th they were going to. They want to eradicate all the Jews from that village, and the king went along with it until he found out that it was the Jewish people, and his wife was Jewish, and he used the gallows for the bad guy <laughs> and hung them, and then for they hanging. had a party and celebrated, and then six weeks later was the Passover. And that's that's exactly where it all started. That's where it all started. And, and here's what's so funny about that. They have the big party first now, and then we do Lent. <laughs> we got to repent for all the things we did during the party. But anyway, that's that's a neither here nor there. I can't remember everybody's name. Wait, was it Ruth? Was it Ruth? Uh, it was Ma, uh, Mordecai was the Jewish guy, and, and what was the? The king was uh, Zerus. Esther and was it the was lady. Esther, yeah. yeah. Right, Esther was the lady. Yeah, and but exactly was he thrown. Yep. And so here's the thing. We, we look at all that, right? We just went through that season. And people give up things. And they said, hey, we're fasting this because we're, we're celebrating this Lent thing. Can I tell you sometimes what you got to fast? And, <coughs> Sister, hey, close your eyes and your ears. There's a reason I told her that. Sometimes you might have to fast your iPad. Oh. <laughs> all you teenagers, it's your turn. Sometimes you got to turn off your cell phone. In the old days when Brother Hay taught this, you know what I used to say? You like this, Roper. You know what I told them all? You need to turn off your TV and not watch soap operas. Yeah. Man, I used to like that metal when I was a young preacher. Man, I tell you what, when you tell them they got to turn off them soap operas, and for all you guys that think it's only ladies, the biggest revolt I ever had when I was in the military, one time we were getting ready to deploy overseas, and I have to go in and brief this group of guys. we got to go in and get our briefing, so i got to go get their attention. They were watching one of them soap operas. I think it was Days of Our Lives. But anyway, it's the one where that guy has got killed like 100 times. Stefano. Stefano, yeah. See, I know who that is. Anyway, they sent her hay in, and I had to get all these guys' attention. I went in and turned off the soap opera. And all these guys, man, they were in revolt. They go, hey! Hey, wait! You can't turn that off! I was like, look, guys. <laughs> I was already... <laughs> anyway, we didn't turn on the TV either, just in case you're wondering. But here's the deal. <laughs> this facet thing has to do with taking personal time, not just food, but the most precious gift that you have. This is Brother Hayes' opinion. How many know I always tell you my opinion? Because I know a lot of people teach that it's always food. And I understand the Bible talks about fasting and, and having the Daniel fast and all those things and fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. But here's what we forget about that fast. Do you know that Jesus separated himself from everybody for 40 days and 40 nights? Yeah. That simplified it. It's just uh, putting away stuff that serves self. That's right. Stuff that serves you. There's a whole bunch of stuff. There's a big list of that. Put yourself <laughs> aside. And if you're going to fast and you're going to pray. Another term is emptying yourself. That's right. You have to empty yourself of all those things that has your attention. How many know that sometimes the biggest fast you've got to do is a fear, doubt, hello? Now think about that. Sometimes you've got to get that stuff out of your system so you can hear God. Because Brother Michael hit on it. It's not that they don't think God can they're not sure that he will. And what is that really in simple terms? Doubt. That's doubt. How many of us have been guilty of having that doubt? Sure. 
How many know it's easy for Brother Hay to pray for somebody else's family? A lot easier than it is for praying for my own. Here's what I want to do. I just need to kick them somewhere to straighten them up. <laughs> that's what I think. How many know, but that's not the answer. And so when I see all these other things going on in other people's lives, how many know it's easy for Brother Hay to pray for them, tell them what to do and all that thing, because I'm not personally involved in it. So here's what I want to get across to you. If you're really going to fast for a change in your life, Brother Singletary hit on it, you have to empty yourself of yourself. And you've got to separate yourself to where your attention is focused on God. Not just from food. I mean, you know, for some people, they eat like a bird anyway. Some people fast in 40 days is no big deal. They probably eat less in 40 days than Brother Hay eats in a day. That's not a big deal for them. But if I took their cell phone, how many know that might be a different issue? Right? So it's not about how we do these things. It's about where we turn our focus and our attention. Okay, we're going to try to do one more and then uh, we'll be done because this is what I want you to be thinking about. We're going to be in John chapter 14, verse 12, Brother Randy. He says, what two things did Jesus say a person who believed in him would be able to do? Now, I'm going to read this real slow because I want you to catch what it says. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me. Preachers that believe on me. Is that what it says? Forever. Super saints. Super evangelists. Hmm. He that believeth on me. The works that I do shall he do also. Now, here's the part that's really cool. And greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. That's what we have Jesus for in our life. It's not about us. It's about a relationship with him. And here's what you forget as a Christian. I think the biggest disservice that preachers have done in the church is convincing people that only preachers have this special insight these special gifts and a special touch. That's not what Jesus is saying here. And until the church gets back to the basic, that inside of you, we just celebrated Easter. Do you know that the same power that caused him to be resurrected dwells in you? Amen. Have you ever thought about that? You know what? Sister Phyllis, 17 years ago when the doctor said, hey man, there's nothing else we can do. This is just what you got to live with. Okay. I understood what he was telling me. I understood exactly what he said. I remember the first few years, I was getting all kinds of angiograms and tests and poor Sister Hay be freaked out and everybody be freaked out and I'd be freaked out. All this crazy stuff going on. But then I began to reach into a measure of faith. And here's what I re realized. You know what? Satan can't kill me. Right. Now think about that for a minute. Because the second I close my eyes in death in this world, I open them in eternity in his presence. Amen. And the same power that resurrected Jesus Christ dwells in me. Why do you think the Bible says not to be afraid of those that can kill this mortal body? Now think about that for a minute. But rather, fear the one who controls the destiny of your soul. Boy, that's something to think about, isn't it? So now, if I'm sick, and I'm struggling, and I have to go through this stuff every day, and I finally had to get to this place in Brother Hayes' life years ago, and I had to come to a decision. Was I going to believe God? Or was I going to allow the enemy to use this to define who I was? And I remember preaching a few days after I had my first heart attack. And people said, Brother Hay, are you sure you should be doing that? I couldn't think of anything better to do than to be preaching this word. That's going to scare some of you. But I think there would be no better way to go out of this world than with my hands raised worshiping God. Whether I'm in a church service, 
whether I'm in my prayer time early in the morning or late at night, whether I'm involved at what I'm doing with God, how many can think if you just begin to recognize that? Now, our young people are going to struggle with this. Brother understands it. You guys, it's so hard to wrap your arms around these things when you're young. And I talked to Ryan the other day, and I close with this. Good place to mark, Randy. Because I want you to think what Jesus is really saying. He's saying it's not just preachers that have the authority to do these things. But do you know that if we keep that power in a select group, I don't know if any of you have been to Europe or had the opportunity to go to Europe, but if you've been to Europe and you've been to any of the great cathedrals and these big churches, there's something that you'll notice. The preacher stood way up there. Way up there. Everybody else was down there. Please don't laugh when I tell you this. Even when I preached in state meetings and other places and churches with <coughs> lots of people, okay? Thousand people. Guess where Brother Hay always preaches? On the floor. Sister Hay said, on the floor. Yeah. You know why? Because I'm just like you. You know what, Ben? I can elevate myself over here and say, well, I'm not quite to that preacher's task, but man, I'm still ahead of you. And you know, then there are ones that are here and go, hey, now I've really attained. Men, not only am I ahead of them preachers, but now I'm really ahead of you. I was going to jump, but that might not work. <laughs> I'll step <laughs> softly. <laughs> but here's what I want to say to you. That's not how this works. You see, the youngest person, Rope, I don't know if you're the youngest in here. I don't know if one of the girls is younger. Are you younger than Roper? Pretty close. Ty? Pretty close. Okay, listen to Brother Hay. You're going to like this. Do you have, know that you have just as much of the power of God in your life as Brother Hay? You need to hear that. You need to know that. Rope, you need to know that. You need to know that when Jesus is within you, you have the same power and authority as anybody else. And people say, wait a minute, bro, hey, you just are telling people that's just making this. That's the problem. We're trying to tell people they don't have that authority. I don't see that in this scripture. You know how many times bro, hey, has read this scripture? I read it all the time. And I say, God, how can I convince people of the power they should have in their life if only they would believe and understand what God wants to do for them? Think about that. You don't have to do the things that the enemy says you do. You have authority over him. Michael. I read a story of a group of Pentecostal preachers and um, some of their families that went. I think it was in New Mexico. And um, they were having healing services and all of this. And they were in this one place and... and uh, they, there was a guy in there in the wheelchair, and they'd had a big healing service, and they got ready to close the service. And this little girl, she was five, six years old, um, she raised her hand, and the preacher called on her, you know, just to humor her. This cute little girl, what's she going to say? And she said, we can't close yet because he hasn't been healed, and pointed that man that none of them prayed for. And the preacher says, oh, do you want to pray for him? She said, well, yeah, I guess. And the preacher says, okay, well, why don't, why don't you just go ahead and pray for him then? And she prayed a little simple prayer, and that man walked out of a church on his own two feet. And let Brother Hay tell you something. If you don't feel the presence of the Lord in this, you need to check your relationship with God. Because that's the kind of God that Brother Hay serves. He's not looking for those that want to elevate themselves. He's looking for those that want to elevate him. And those that have decreased and increased, allowed him to increase in their life. And, and I'll never forget, one time I was in a church service, and uh, there was a couple there. It was a mixed race couple. Uh, she was white, he was black. And you say, Brother Hay, why do you have to tell us that? I'll tell you why I have to tell you. Because in the time frame when this took place, people in the church did not accept that. And there was a big time evangelist in the church. And he was praying for a lot of people. And this lady came to Brother Hay, and this is what she said. She's crying. It was almost like they didn't want to pray for her. I mean, you know, you can tell when somebody's just not interested in you. 
I never forget, Sister Hale know who I'm talking about when she hears the whole story. She's crying, Sister Elaine. She says, I've been praying that God will allow me to have a baby. And I tell you, there are good Christian people who said they'll never have kids because they were a mixed race. I'm like, really? <laughs> Where all this crazy stuff come from, right? <laughs> people are just so rude and crude and stupid. Well, I can't say that word. <laughs> I got a three-year-old that lives in my house, and if I say that word, he will be telling everybody that word. So, y'all help me in my unlearned way to be better use better words. Anyway, my ignorance and their ignorance. And I said to her, I said, you know what? I wasn't even the pastor. I didn't even have credentials at that time. I had credentials with a different group than the Church of God at that time, but I was in a Church of God church. I took her by hand. I said, I don't know who told you all this crazy stuff. I said, but the God I serve has already heard your request. I knew the second I prayed for her that God was going to answer her prayer. You know what? It wasn't just a few weeks later she came back to church and said to Brother Hay, you're not going to believe this. I'm having a baby. And you know what I told her? I said, isn't God good? Do you know they got orders and were gone? That was the last time I ever saw them. Never saw them again. And people will say to me all the time, Verhe, do you really believe that God puts people in places for a specific point of time and moment? Absolutely. And that includes putting you in those places. It might be Sister Claudia out there in the senior center. And all of a sudden, God gets a hold of her and says, hey, you need to go over here and pray for this person because I want to do something. Now, Sister Claudia's got a decision. I heard Brother Hay talk about that Wednesday night, but yeah, that's his Brother Hay. Be a Brother Hay. He's going to be good, though, right, Sister Claudia? I hope that what she does is, you know what? I got this funny feeling. And, and all of a sudden, I have this overwhelming sense. For some unknown reason, I don't even like that person. <laughs> but I feel like I need to go pray for him. God, you can't be talking to me. <laughs> Must have been that pizza I ate last night. <laughs> Can I just be honest with you and close with this? I believe with all my heart that the reason we're not seeing more works like Jesus promised is because we refuse to be used to him. We get our list of excuses. We tell God how we're not worthy, we're not good enough, he can't use us. I'm here to tell you, God isn't worried about your vessel as much as he's worried about your relationship with him. And here's what I love. If God has to, he can use an old donkey. <laughs> I don't want him to use a donkey for me. I want him to use me. It should be every one of our prayers. Whatever happened in the church that caused us to stop praying, Lord, use me. Not use the preacher, not, you know, use Sister Hay, not use Sister Betsy, not use somebody else. Lord, use me. Can I just be as honest as I can to close this out? If we could just get back to that place where we started praying, God, use me you might be surprised what happens. Do you know you might be having trouble with your children? And God might tell you, just stand still, be quiet, and I'm going to tell you what to do. And God might tell you, don't say anything, just put your arms around them. And I know that I know that I know that somebody's thinking, yeah, so I'm going to be the wind pierce? No. The strongest person is the person that yields their will to God. Because at the end of the day, you become so vulnerable at that very moment. You know why? What happens if God doesn't do what he's telling me he's going to do? What happens if I reach over there and pray for him and they bite my arm off? Yum! Right? Not literally bite your arm off, but you know what Brother Hayes talking about, right? Do you know that the results 
aren't your responsibility. They're God's. And just like Brother Hayes said, there are a lot of people that say, oh, you're just being a, a chump. They're taking advantage of you. Okay. But one of these days when they stand before God, there won't be any excuses. And that's why the Bible says every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess. Because I believe at that very moment when they stand before God, God will reveal to them the missed opportunities and the way they responded. Does that make sense? And so we're not responsible for the results. We're only responsible for doing what God has called us to do. And I want you to think about the scripture all week. He did not designate this to the ministry. It's just like when he said for the church to go into the whole world. Did he say only a handful of people? He said all of us, right? So what happened that changed and all of a sudden we put a praise team together and we put a ministry team together and we hired this person and that person and do all these things. Man, we're good to go now. And we hadn't raised or took somebody by hand and prayed with them in so long, we probably forgot. Poor little Brandon and Sister Ada tell you, it's funny. We were trying to teach him how to pray. Sometimes that could be a disaster when you let a three-year-old be in charge. But here's what happens at our table. Sometimes Kaylee's a little slow. Every time. Pretty much every time. And if it's not Kaylee, it's probably his, mo her, his mom. But here's Brandon. I'm not praying yet. I told him, <laughs> I just told him this tonight. I said, let's just pray. Nope. We got to wait for Kaylee. I'm like, really, Brandon? I'm thinking I'm hungry for one thing. And come on, Brandon, really? Nope, we're, this is what he says. It's real. Not until Kaylee gets here. Kaylee finally gets to where the table is. And guess what happens? We didn't all have hands yet. I said, okay, Kaylee's here. He just look. He don't even say nothing. He just looks. Then he just got that. Look. So Stray takes my hand. Finally, we all take hands. He prays. And here's what I need to say to you. What would happen if the church all of a sudden took hands and prayed like we're supposed to? Let's stand. We'll be dismissed. I'm going to ask you if you'll scoot together and take somebody's hand because I'm going to pray with you as a corporate group tonight as we get ready to leave. Don't be embarrassed. Just scoot over and grab somebody's hand. And, and I don't want you to think Brother Hay is just going through some motions here. I believe in this. Brother Singletary and Brother George and Sister Elaine and them, they've been around Brother Hay for a long time. They've been here uh, even before my mom and them come to go to church here. One thing you got me, Brother Singletary, I've always believed this way. I believe in the power of taking somebody's hand next to you. I believe in the power of grabbing a hold of that person next to you and praying for them. People always get mad, and I know we're in a hurry, but I promise I'm only going to pray a second, but here's what I want you to take out of this. When you leave here, understand, in here we're safe, but how many know how many thousands of people in Portales, New Mexico, right now are not safe? They need somebody to take them by the hand and say, look, there's something better. I've been in the emergency room and listened to a drug addict beg them to send him to rehab. And there's no place for him to go. I've been there when people have given up hope and don't know which way to turn. And all I can say to you is, if we would stand together, we can make a difference in somebody's life. And maybe even in our own life by allowing God to use us be his hands extended. Father, as we join hands and we close this service, Lord, I am praying that you would bring these words to life for each one here. God, that your power within them in their relationship with you gives them the ability to trust you and Lord, for you to perform miracles through them. And Lord, I pray more than anything else, allow each one within the sound of my voice if there's one struggling with whether or not they're in a right relationship with you, Father, remind them, remind them that you cast no one away. Be with each one, protect and keep them. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. God bless you. I appreciate you. See you Saturday. Yes, sir.
Don't forget, Saturday, 2 o'clock.